leaving his disciples post-resurrection, today's scripture is from a different time of departure. It's the evening of the Last Supper, the night before Jesus' crucifixion. Dinner is over, and Jesus and his disciples are sitting around the table together. Jesus has been saying his goodbyes and giving them some final instructions. And now, he pauses to pray aloud to God. He's in the presence of his disciples, so they hear what he is praying. And we listen in, too, as he speaks of us to God. We pick up with Jesus in mid-prayer. John chapter 17, verse 6. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name, that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name, that you have given me, I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Amen. Good to see little baby Isaac Whitaker with us in the congregation today. And can you hardly blame Isaac for crying out in the middle of that passage? <laughs> I hope that that is the most confusing thing that you've heard all week. And if it's not, I'm sorry. <laughs> What in the world is Jesus talking about here? Or should we say, what in the world is the Gospel writer John having Jesus pray about for 20 plus verses? Aren't you glad that when the powers that be decided which prayer would be the Lord's prayer, the one that Christians would recite for ages to come, aren't you glad they chose the Our Father instead of this one? I mean, really? It's a confusing passage. It's verbose, repetitive, and somewhat ethereal in nature. John's Gospel is what we might call New Agey, because it's always talking about the world as if it's this thing outside of us, as if we can decide whether or not we live in the world. I suppose now we could be Mars One astronauts and escape this world altogether. I hear that they're still taking names. But that wasn't an option in John's day. And it's not necessarily an appealing option for most of us, either. So what in the world is Jesus talking about? Sadly, because this passage is so hard to understand, it often gets condensed down to a cliché. Christians are in this world, but not of this world. Meaning, we Christians are different, set apart. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, and we're determined not to go down with it. 
Somehow, sticking with one another and sticking close to Jesus will protect us from this world that we are forced to live in, at least for now. We're biding our time until we make it to heaven or until Jesus comes back and brings heaven to earth, whichever comes first. In the meantime, we need to stay away from all of the material and ungodly things of this world and stick with what we know, that Jesus loves us. Rather than venture into what we don't know, how to deal with others not like us, those not of God. When this prayer is reduced to a cliché, see how easy it is to set up a dividing wall. One of two things happens in such a dichotomy. We either hunger down and wait to be rescued from this God-forsaken world, or we put up our dukes and it becomes us versus the world. It's like the name of a summer blockbuster. In the world, but not of it. Christians versus everyone else. <coughs> These divisions, they always create fear. And that fear either debilitates us to the point that we fade away in our faith, blending into the world around us or staying behind closed doors with people like us. Or that fear drives us to fight back against the people we believe are of this world as opposed to of God, blaming them for our messed up state of affairs. You know, the Muslims, the terrorists, the Democrats, the Republicans, the atheists, the fundamentalists, the gays, the NRA, the pacifists, the black lives, the blue lives. Need I go on? We love to point fingers. But I hope you'll agree that such a dichotomy of either passively hiding or proactively fighting is not only helpful, it's surely not what Jesus meant when he says that we do not belong to this world. Pastor Danielle Schroyer wrestles with this dichotomy too. She writes, the word world occurs 13 times between verses 6 through 19. And it's like half the time the world is a dangerous disease on the loose, and half the time the world is this place where disciples are found and sent because it's where Jesus wants his joy to be complete. If the verses were a Venn diagram, she said, there would be three verses on each side. Three verses about being in the world, three verses about being of the world, and then two verses in that middle overlapping section. And she says maybe that's metaphorically accurate in some way. Maybe the prayer is confusing because we're all stuck in this intertwined mess of already and not yet. She concludes by saying, I guess my problem is that I'd rather like to see Jesus as the glue that connects everyone and everything together, rather than as a guy playing the twister with his hands and feet convoluted all over the place. I can make sense of some of the verses if we view the world as alluding to the powers that be, the systems of injustice and the like. But that still leaves us with some problems, she says. It just seems the world is pejorative in this prayer, or at the very least, off-putting. And I'm not really sure what to do about that. What does that mean, coming from the gospel? that tells us that God so loved the world. What does it mean? The world is good, isn't it? Well, we get mixed messages about this all the time. We come to church on Sunday and hear that God created the world and called it good and filled it with God's beloved children who are good and that whatever is going on in the world But then we go out into what we might call the real world, Monday through Saturday, and we're fed messages all week that the world is bad and full of bad people. 24-hour news stations thrive off of keeping us convinced 
that the world is dangerous and to be feared. When is the last time that you saw a breaking news story that ran for hours that was about something positive? Breaking news is almost always about death and destruction, things that devastate our lives. So there's something very tempting about the idea of wanting to escape from this crazy world that we live in. Travel agents, the tourist industry, and the real estate business, they don't know this. They spend millions on ad campaigns to lure us to take luxury vacations where our every desire is met, to buy a second home in the mountains or get a timeshare at the beach. These kind of retreats feed off our consumer culture and the false ideals of the good life, as if the beach can make all things better. Don't get me wrong, the beach can make a lot of things better, <laughs> but not all things. Today, we see that this human desire to retreat, to get respite from the world, is actually as ancient as the Bible. In fact, Thomas Troger says, religious faith may intensify the desire for escape from the world. Having glimpsed a vision of what is holy and good, the human spirit may hunger not for promised splendor of luxury resorts, but for a community and a way of being that avoids the clamor and conflict of the world. The history of Christianity is filled with stories of groups of people like this, right? Monasteries, convents, reform movements, communal living, retreat centers. While each is unique, all of these efforts are about creating a space, a space that ideally would allow for a full realization of a faithful and holy life centered in Christ. And it seems that the desire to live apart from the world, it was stirring in the late first century community to which John was writing. Last week we talked about what a volatile time it was and how followers of Jesus were being persecuted by Jewish religious authorities and Roman political authorities alike. And as the members of John's community were understandably attracted to a life of faith that would disengage them from the powers that were opposed to the gospel and therefore opposed to them. How good it would feel, right, to retreat into their own group, to recall the stories of Jesus, to sense his presence in their meals of bread and wine, to enjoy each other's supportive fellowship and no longer have to defend their beliefs to the world. It's likely then that John uses Jesus' prayer and makes it 20 plus verses long because he needs to address this growing desire among his believers for a more ingrown, safer life of faith. So to counter this dreamy ideal that they have through the words of Jesus' prayer, John provides an alternative. An alternative that means staying in the world that God created without giving into the pressures of the world that war against God's creation. Because at its worst, the world is detrimental to their faith. But at its best, the world is a delight to their faith. It's not that the whole of the world is bad. That's not what's being said here. Is that as bad things were happening to them, they started to see the world through that tunnel vision. And they started to jump to conclusions that everything must be bad. Conclusions that are counter to the truth. The truth being that God desires for us to have life and to have it in abundance. And not just us, but all people. That is, after all, why Jesus said that he came. But we forget this the minute fear creeps into our lives. When there is no fear, the world is our friend. But when there is fear, the world becomes our foe. Knowing the power the fear has, that's why Jesus prays as he does. 
Jesus offers an alternative model that can empower this community to live in the world no matter what comes their way. They are to stay, he says, under the protective care of God, not just living for themselves, for their own desires, but living as the image of God's very self, with God's desires. In other words, to live in the protective care of God is to live within God's perspective. To live in the midst of all this chaos and yet see as God sees. This holiness that they were hoping to achieve by withdrawing away, well, that's not found, it turns out, through disengagement with the world. Rather, this holiness of which John and Jesus speak is found through the action of God, becoming immersed in the world. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. Jesus recognizes their desire to be holy, but turns that desire in a new way and says, look in the scripture. And not just in the scripture, but look in the living word of God that is alive and among you right now, being revealed here and now. I'm sending you into the world for this word, for this good. And that phrase, sent into the world, is the exact opposite of getting out of the world, right? In one clear verse, Jesus reminds the church that the pattern of Jesus' own life was not escaping from the world, but engaging with it. Of course, the irony of this whole thing is that as Jesus praises the fact that we need to remain in the world, he himself is about to leave it. It's contradictory. But John knows that his listeners need these helpful words from Jesus, even if Jesus himself is leaving. They need to be encouraged because as a community, they are exhausted, and they have good reason to be. They're exhausted by the world, by the persecution, by the questions, by the hurt, by the pain, and they're ready to be done with it. We can relate to this exhaustion, maybe. ISIS, Amtrak, Deflategate, court trials for marathon bombers and theater shootings, Politicians that tear each other down instead of building our country up. Global warming, tornadoes, earthquakes. Not to mention all the griefs and pains in our own lives that exhaust us. We know what it's like to be a community exhausted with the world's violence and corruption, lying and destruction. We know what it's like to feel despair over our seeming inability to make a difference. The temptation for us then, as it was for John's audience, is actually, I think, summed up quite well by another John. John Mayer, singer-songwriter who wrote Waiting on the World to Change. Me and all my friends were all misunderstood. They say we stand for nothing, and there's no way we ever could. Now we see everything that's going wrong with the world and those who lead it. We just feel like we don't have the means to rise above and beat it. So we keep waiting, waiting on the world to change. Now if we had the power to bring our neighbors home from war, they would have never missed a Christmas, no more ribbons on their door. And when you trust your television, what you get is what you got. Because when they own the information, oh, they can bend it all they want. That's why we're waiting. Waiting on the world to change. It's not that we don't care. We just know that the fight ain't fair. So we keep on waiting. Waiting on the world to change. Well, while it may be true that the fight ain't fair, Christians, are called to act, not wait. No matter how futile our actions might seem, to not act 
is to say that we believe God is done working in the world and working on us. And I think, I hope, that you are here this morning because you believe that God's not done yet with you or me or with our world. Of course, not everyone feels this way. Lots of people are done with God, or so they say. The Pew Report on Religion in America was released this week. If you read it, you know that it shows that over the past seven years, Christianity has gone down nearly 8% in our country. And it's not that another religion is taking over, per se. It's just that fewer people are calling themselves Christians, and they're mostly leaving the church for no church. They're leaving believing for non-believing. Methodist pastor Don Underwood gave his perspective on this declining percentage this week. He said the problem is not that we are getting smaller, it's that we have been making the gospel small. In spite of our pretensions otherwise, we live in a remarkably cautious world, and we tend to make small and incremental decisions. We play around with religion, he says, offering it as a lifestyle enhancement or an ethical system, or as an encouragement to good works. We fall silent in the face of scientific discovery rather than claiming and embracing it as wondrous evidence of how big God is. We encourage people to merely dabble in faith, the implied promise being, don't worry, it'll only change your life minimally. He finishes by saying, as long as we continue to downsize Christianity, Christianity will continue to downsize. The alternative would be to reclaim the powerful proclamation that the life of faith is a very dangerous thing, because it will not leave you unchanged. Either God is, or God isn't. And if God is, it will change every single thing about the way in which one's life is understood and lived. That is the gospel of truth. And this is the true world we are of, the gospel world of God's kingdom of justice and peace for all people. If this is the world we are of, then it's the world we must live in. And to live in such a world means that we will live in ways that are more uncomfortable than convenient. It means that we will give away more money than we think we ought living on less so others can have more. And it means that we will pay attention and be bothered when things like skyrocketing rent prices in our city are pushing hardworking people out of housing, causing a rise in homelessness and a severe lack of affordable housing. Go to the forum after worship today to hear more about this. Because you see, it's not that some of us are in this world and some of us are not. We are all in this world together. And if the world reflected the love, peace, and equality of God's kingdom, then it wouldn't be such a bad thing to be of the world, would it? Believe it or not, that's the world God created. And that's the world we're to be helping God recreate again and again, day after day. When Jesus leaves the earth for good, ascending into heaven while blessing his people, they are so moved that they run back to the temple and praise God and bless God. But I think we're given today's text to read on this day because running to the church to praise God and to pray among ourselves is precisely what Jesus is praying that we not do. He doesn't want us isolating ourselves in the cocoon of our church. He says quite clearly, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And as we go into the world and move around it, we have to awaken to the fact that it's the only world we've got. We don't have some otherworldly place to go right now. It's here and now, with these people, these circumstances, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. This is our world. I've quoted Madeline Engel from this pulpit before, and I've quoted these words because I think they state the gospel truth with clarity and conviction. She says, There is nothing so secular that it cannot be sacred, and 
And that is one of the deepest messages of the Incarnation. Another folk singer, Peter Mayer, has a similar sentiment. He writes, when I was a boy, each week on Sunday we would go to church and pay attention to the priest. And he would read the Holy Word and consecrate the Holy Bread, and everyone would kneel and bow. Today, the only difference is, everything is holy now. Everything. Everything is holy now. To see everything and everyone as holy is to starve fear of its fuel, which of course is the vision and comparison. When we begin to erase the dividing line between what is holy and what is not, and who is holy and who is not, we begin to live in the way that God longs for us to live. God so longed for us to live in this way that he sent his son Jesus into the world to show us how. Jesus saw the world through the unified vision of God. Not that he naively thought everything was unified and good, but he saw that possibility and he worked every day to increase its probability. And we're called to do the same. I leave you with the quote that's in your order of worship. Wendell Berry, poet, farmer, writer, he says, we have lived our lives by the assumption that what was good for us would be good for this world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. And that requires that we make the effort to know the world and to learn what is good for them. Jesus knew that in praying for the disciples to be sent into the world, he was not praying for them or us to be sent into the bleak absence of God. Rather, he was praying for them and for us to be sent into the world which is the very heart of God. If the world holds the very heart of God, guess whose job it is to make that heart beat? So what in the world are you 